Hey team, what we're now going to see is how we can use label blocks to train an emotion classification model such that given a piece of text, the model is able to correctly classify which emotion that text falls under amongst a candidate set of 27 different emotion types. The data set that we're going to work with is the Google Emotions data set, which can be found on Hugging Face. And if you see in the summary, it's basically 58,000 carefully curated Reddit comments, along with 27 different emotion categories. We can take a quick preview of this data set. We see the actual Reddit thread in the text column, some metadata fields over here, as well as the emotions in these columns. The first thing to do is bring this CSV-based data set into label blocks. And the way we can do that is by clicking on Files and Versions, going into the raw folder, and downloading this Parquet file. Once we've downloaded this Parquet file, we can upload it or make it serviceable in whatever sort of framework we want. So if you want to make this available in Google Cloud, we can do that in a Google Drive folder, uh, whatever we feel appropriate. In this case, I've put this in my GCS bucket and I've made this publicly available. So you can simply copy this URL in order to use it. Or if you wanna go down the route of uploading into your private storage, you can simply do that and copy your respective URL. Either way works. Once we have that URL copied, simply navigate over to the ingestion notebook. And first and foremost, we need to install the required dependencies. We'll go ahead and do that and import the right libraries. Once we've done all that setup, we're ready to instantiate the API key, which can be found by going into the homepage of Littlebox, clicking on create an API key, naming this as test key, hitting create, and then copying this API key. The next step is to instantiate the label pandas client using this API key. Label pandas is the open source Python library that the Labelbox team has built in order to facilitate the import of data in a tabular or CSV format as is the case in this situation. You can see this in the documentation over here. The notebook that I put together is actually just a variant of this notebook over here. So if we open this up, we'll see the necessary steps to bring in data from a CSV file. Like I said, I've curated that to be appropriate for this data set, so uh, it's easier to follow along. Once we've instantiated the little pandas client, we need to point the right GCS path using the parquet file that we had created earlier. So once again, copying this URL. And the next three cells are creating a new column within our data frame that simply assigns which emotion that text falls under. So it's looking at all these different emotion columns and saying whichever one has a one, that is going to be our emotion label. Once we've gone ahead and created that, we can see a preview of our newly created data frame over here with this new column. And the next step is to create our ontology. We will get into the specifics of the ontology later, but for the time being, think of the ontology right now as a way to establish the connection between this emotion label column that we've defined over here, as well as what value that will rep be represented in label box. So we've simply said, you can only assign one type of label to each row, which is why we've chosen the radio based option. And we're saying it's only a single option. And these are all the different emotion options that we've specified. We'll get into more detail about this later. For now, you can simply click this cell and the cell as well, which creates the labeling project. And once we've gone ahead and done that, we can run this cell to establish the connection between the fields in our data frame and the fields that will be needed for the ingestion to label box. And this step is going ahead and renaming all of our columns to be in the appropriate label box ingestible format. So it's simply making sure that um, we are prefixing all of the field names with metadata slash string for the metadata and annotation slash radio for the annotation. The final step is to run this cell, which will create the data set within label box and kick off the import job. 
the end result of this should be successful. And if we navigate to the UI, we'll be able to see the data set that we just created. You can see that over here. One thing to note is we've seen how to bring in this data from the CSV file using label pandas. An alternative to this approach is if we store each of these Reddit comments in this column, so these are all the Reddit comments, and if we store each of them in their own text file, we can actually then simply upload all of these text files to our cloud storage of choice. Once again, I've chosen GCP. I can see all these different text files. And then from the UI, we can simply choose a new data set, hit confirm and create. And once that's set up, we can choose the cloud integration. These are different cloud integrations. In this case, I'm using GCS, so I'll select that one. And now this is just a matter of choosing what folder has my data. So in this case, I have an LM Qualtrics and I'll click on this in this folder. These have all my text files, so I'll select that. I cho choose text because that is corresponding to the data in this folder, but the same process can be applied for any of these other unstructured modalities we can see over here. So we'll hit confirm and create. And once this is done, we'll be able to see all of this data be uploaded from the UI. So just a lot quicker method to bring data into Labelbox is from uh, the UI using delegated access. Finally, Labelbox is the industry leader when it comes to working with your different connections. So if you have data stored in a Google Sheets file, for example, over here, it's very easy to establish that connection as well. You can see all of these different connections, uh, all possible to be done using Labelbox. So that wraps up our data ingest. In our next series of videos, we'll be seeing how to perform exploratory data analysis and uh, action upon the data that we've just brought in. Thanks. Now that we've ingested all of our data rows into Labelbox catalog, our next series of steps is going to be how quickly and how easily can we enrich our data? How can we curate our data? And how can we explore our data? So as part of the data ingestion process, we actually brought in the ground truth hardened annotation values on the emotion. So this was all provided from that hugging face data set that we saw earlier. And we also brought in all the additional metadata, such as the author, the subreddit, the uh, Raider ID. And so because of that, we can actually see all of those distributions across the ground truth annotations as well as the metadata. So over here, notice how there's around a 27% share of the data rows have been labeled as neutral. So definitely a stronger lean over there. And it's skewed to the right, as we can see in terms of the other emotions. So just visually, this gives us right off the bat, a general sense for where our uh, deficiencies lie in the current labeling uh, scheme and in our current labels. So what we can do is we can, you know, navigate back into our gallery view, we can, um, you know, validate this by clicking on annotation and saying, you know, what are the annotations that are none, only 807, which are the annotations that currently don't have the label for neutral. So we can see those over here. And what this allows us to do, we can also chain this with the metadata filtering like we saw before, where if we wanted to specify the Raider ID is this specific value, we can see how that narrows down from only 58,000 data rows to 2,500 data rows. Now we can also construct the metadata and the annotations within the UI. So if we go over here and we wanted to add a metadata from the UI, we can go to schema, we go to metadata and hit create. And if you want to do emotion type, we can either set it as a string or an enum and specify what are the different emotion types and do that process from there. Now, if we go back to our data set, um, like I mentioned, we were 
we're privileged in that we already have the metadata and annotations with us. But a lot of the times, and it's very much the case that we don't have these annotations and these metadata, and we want to use catalog to help us enrich and come up with these. And so the way we can do that is by leveraging some of the intelligent filtering capabilities within catalog. As an example, let's say I wanted to find all of the text Reddit messages where the overall theme is related to admiration. And I can toggle this confidence just to feel better about my results. And I see how that's narrowed down from 58,000 data rows down to 2,100 data rows. And what this is doing is it's not looking for raw text occurrences of admiration, which we can also do by clicking on find text and looking for the word admiration. Obviously there's nothing there because there aren't any records that have the flat out the word admiration in them. But if we do a natural language search, what this is doing is it's cross-referencing all of the text in the embedding space that are similar or close in distance to this embedding. So Labelbox intelligently calculates these embeddings when you bring in the text records or any records into the platform. And so we can see over here, like I mentioned, narrowed down from 50,000 to around 2,000. And if I wanted to further filter this down, I could chain this with, you know, this is a record that looks and is aligned with the theme of admiration. And perhaps this one is as well. And so is this one. I can do, you know, select all these and hit similarity to further filter this down. Now it's only 788 instead of 2,000. And once again, I can toggle this confidence to see how that impacts the total results shown. So now it's down to 68. I can keep toggling until I get a steady state. This is just one. So this seems like a good value to uh, work off of. And now from here, I can you know select all of these and either add the metadata tag directly in terms of the admiration um, and say, this is the admiration value, or I can apply a classification to this and say, you know, this is the project, this is the labeling queue, and I want to apply this admiration label. What we can also do is save this as a slice so that anytime new records get added and they meet this specific filtering criteria, so the embedding for that new asset needs to be close to this admiration uh, vector at this confidence level, and it needs to be similar to these three records that we've chosen over here. Anytime a new data comes in and it meets these two criteria, it'll automatically get added to the slice. So this is nice if you want to just set and forget some of these business logic processes once so that it persists for the duration of the project or of you bring in uh, net new data. So I can save this as admiration slice and hit save. Let's go ahead and uh, create that slice. One other thing to note is on top of the intelligent filtering capabilities here, if we wanted a more visual representation for how we can score or assign metadata or labels to our data, we can also use the projector view. So let's go ahead and cr create a new filter and we can see these embeddings are being created when I click on the projector view. And in a couple seconds, I can see uh, visually what the embedding space looked like. And if I wanted to narrow down or hone in to a specific section that I think is an outlier. So over here, we can see all of these tend to have this theme of happy cake day or birthdays and thank yous. So what I can do is select all of them. And then once again, add their metadata or add a classification similar to what we saw uh, before. So if I want to do metadata and do outlier type and choose gratitude and birthday. So that wraps up the intelligent filtering capabilities within catalog. In our next step, we will see how we can leverage foundational models and model assisted labeling to take and enrich our data and send that over to a labeling project. What we're now going to see is how Labelbox annotate 
is offered within the context of the product. The best way to navigate to annotate is by clicking on the annotate button in the left hand side navigation panel. And before even going into the details, just a really quick high level overview of the best way to think about annotate is really just a consolidated system of record for your labeling and your review operations. So you might have labels that are coming from a third party provided model or a foundation model like GPT, or you might have labels coming directly from human labelers. You need to have a way to consolidate these two different workflows, as well as your reviewers that are coming in and reviewing these labels. All of these can be encapsulated within a label box project. So the way to create a new project is by clicking on the new project button in the top right hand corner. We had actually already done this as part of the data ingestion setup. So if you recall, we constructed this ontology and an ontology is a way to represent what are the key assets or key features that we want to enrich or annotate or label within our records. So once we created this ontology and attached it to this labeling project, we can actually see the Google Emotions demo project over here in our UI. If we click into it, we can navigate to the ontology over here and see the ontology that we constructed from the SDK. So this is the one representing the single emotion, multiple emotions as a checklist, as we see over here, and a Spanish language translation as a text field. We can also attach instructions as we feel appropriate if we want to guide our labeling workforce to understand better how they can go about doing the task. So this is where we can attach as a PDF. We've observed classifications as our annotations. What we can also do is attach if we wanted different types of object-based annotations as well. So maybe we want to identify a person within our text. So this is a way we can do that. And then if we click on person, we can say, and say he did, this would be the person. So this is how we distinguish between object-based and classification-based annotations. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one just because we don't need it. But once we have our ontology configured over here, we can hit save. And the sort of next step would be to add data rows to our project. Now, because we had brought in our text-based assets as part of the import, we can see that over here when we specified the upload method as import. So because we did this, we already sent all of these text-based assets along with their labels, along with the emotion label that we annotated over here. We sent that by default to the done workflow stage. If we had instead used the uh, malbase approach, then this would have been sent to the uh, initial labeling task or the initial review task. We can also see what the labeling and review workflow looks like for labelers and reviewers respectively within the label box editor. So if we click on start labeling in the top right over here, this will take us to the labeling editor and notice how there aren't any values that are pre-populated in these uh, drop downs in this text selection, which means a labeler would have to come in and select the right emotion from scratch and keep doing this for all the different data records. So that's what the process looks like for labelers. Now for reviewers, once it gets moved to the review stage, they would come in and s click on initial review task. And now we see, you know, these are populated with values and they can come in and either approve or reject them as is, or they can offer or, you know, make edits to the labels themselves, or they can offer suggestions in terms of issues and say, maybe this label needs rework create the issue and uh, go through the process that way. So approve, reject, edit, or create an issue. 
and keep going through the process for all the different labels. So that's the workflow in the editor for labelers and reviewers. The intelligent filtering capabilities in Annotate exist just as they do in Catalog. And over here, we can filter once again on different labeling actions, being in different queues, uh, whatever we feel appropriate. We can also see the um, visual representation of our data by clicking on this icon. And something that is beneficial here is that in the rework stage, we can take advantage of this filtering to help with active learning. So maybe within, obviously in this case, we only have one uh, label to rework, but if you were to have a hundred different such labels to rework, then you could focus on a, or curate a subset of them and say, oh, I'm noticing a theme around maybe 20 or 30 of the hundred labels. And this is a pretty important theme for the business to solve and for, in order for them all to get right. So we can see that visually over here using this similar to selection option. And we can action upon it by uh, changing the priority. So maybe we want to assign a very high priority in order to make sure that the labelers review this uh, quicker. So this is how we can do that within uh, annotate as well. So two key points to mention here is by default workflows within label box work in the following manner. They go from the initial labeling task to the initial review task. And then from the review task, they can either be approved, in which case they move to the done stage, or they get rejected and they move to the rework stage for the labeler to rework. And we can also fine tune this and add new workflow tasks as we feel appropriate based on maybe we want a certain team or a certain set of reviewers to only look at all of the annotations that get marked as anger and annoyance. So that's something that we can configure over here and hit apply. And these are the different ways in which we can uh, configure those fine tune workflows. Now, one other thing to note is that once again, we had specified import as the upload method. So we had seen these automatically get added to the done stage. This is a variant of model assisted labeling. So obviously in this case, we had you know, our column that represents the actual annotation, but in the customer's case, they could have a way in which they're having their own models that are coming with predictions. And so long as this prediction follows this and has been able to attach in this similar sort of format, then we can import that as a pre-label and specify mal as our import method. So just wanted to point out one way in which we can incorporate mal into our workflow and based on what we've seen so far. So a few other things as we sort of round out uh, the capabilities within annotate, we covered workflow, we have the performance, which talks about the different evaluation metrics across our labeling and reviewing task. So in this case, we don't really have any labelers or reviewers attached to this project yet, but if we were to have that, this is an example where we can see the amount of time spent across the project, as well as how that is disaggregated across the individual labelers over here for both labeling and reviewing. So if we navigate back to our project, we can see that over here, we have the ability to add members either through this workflow where we can specify and add a member by the their email by clicking on and inviting and specifying a, a member by their email as well as the specific role we want to invite them as. And finally, one other topic to talk about when we come to the um, project setup is we have configured this project to be a benchmark based project but we can also configure a labeling project to be a consensus-based project. And in this situation, what we would do is we would hit new project. We would select whatever one best represents our case. In this case, it's text. And we could say consensus text project. And we would specify consensus as our option over here. And then we hit save. And for the ontology, we can use the same one that we've been using for the other project. 
So we'll hit next over here, hit save. And then the next step is to add data to this project. So we'll go ahead and click that add data button. And so now if we navigate to our data set, let's just queue up a few examples to send to our project. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now over here, we can see how the consensus is enabled. So it's done at a batch level, which means for all these five records, we assign a priority on a scale of one to five, one being the highest priority and five being the lowest priority. So you can have different batches that you send to the labeling project at different priorities based on how importantly you think those batches need to be labeled. Once you set the data row priority over there, the next step is to specify how many data rows within this batch are going to be labeled multiple times. So this is where we set the coverage. So, you know, setting it at 70%, for example, would mean four out of five of these text-based assets are going to be labeled X many times. So in this case, I've done two number of labelers would be two, but you can obviously up this up to however many you would like. And, you know, once we go ahead and configure that, we can just do one over here and say the number of labelers would be three and specify that and then hit submit batch. So we'll see over here that we now have one of the data rows has the consensus enabled because that's what we specified in our setup. Now, what it looks like in terms of the export is that once three different labelers go ahead and label this, there's going to be a consensus score field in the export, in the JSON export. We'll have a value between zero and one, and that denotes the score for that label. So that rounds out how to set up a consensus-based workflow for your labeling project. And yeah, the uh, final sort of thing to note is that uh, how the export looks like once you, you know, take all this label data and you want to use that to train uh, a model, we can select, in this case, we can do a subset of our data, we can hit export data, select the fields that we want, hit export JSON, this will trigger an export job. And this export job and everything that I'm showing you can be done from the SDK to automate this uh, workflow. So this is now finished. I'll go ahead and download. And we can see this over here. If we want to make this a little bit more user friendly, we see this was the export as a new line delimited JSON. I'll save this as a JSON so we can see this uh, better in VS Code. So if I open this up in a text editor of choice, we can now see uh, what this looks like. And I can see the all the different metadata as well as the uh, labels themselves. So this is what the output uh, export looks like. So that wraps up the annotate portion of Labelbox and its product offerings. What we also see is the ability to leverage a foundation model or an open source model to help with the pre-labeling. So once again, we are privileged in that we already have our ground truth annotations, but there are a lot of situations where we don't have the annotation and we need to come up with these annotations. And so we can use any of these foundation models as a labeling co-pilot that will take a first pass at creating labels for these data rows. And so we can see examples over here. If you wanted to bring in your own custom model, that is also very possible and can be done by contacting the customer solutions team. So just as everyone's favorite GPT, GPT-4 model, uh, we can load that up and select our ontology. And in this case, we have that Google Emotions ontology that we had set up earlier in the data ingestion process. So if you recall, we had used this ontology to uh, construct how we want to uh, have our labeling teams go about uh, annotating our text. So because of that setup, we now already have that ontology in place. And we can actually see that 
in our annotate project. So if we move over to the Google Emotions demo project, we see that we have this um, annotation and classifications already set up. So this represents the single one, which we can see over here. And this represents the multiple emotions. So if I wanted to highlight multiple emotions, that's supposed to just a single one because maybe there might be two emotions that are more similar to each other, that's possible. And then this is a text field for the language translation. If I wanted to convert the text here to a different language like Spanish. So this was created because we had run that script earlier. And because of that, I can now go back to my foundry model, my GPT model, I select my ontology and it's pre-populated with the prompt here based on the ontology that I've configured over here. So if we go through, we can see answer the Spanish language translation, classify one of the options, and if we had generate preview, this will go ahead and perform this task. So we can see as that's running, we should be able to get an output in a few seconds on what this will look like on our data set. One thing to note is that we can also configure hyperparameters if we want to uh, make this more reproducible in the future and save it as an app configuration such that all of these hyperparameters and these prompts would be um, can be referenced at a later point in time. So you don't have to keep going in and setting these up. So we see that the foundational model in GPT has returned and we are noticing these annotations or these pre-labels rather that GPT has come up with. You can see the single emotion is being disapproval and obviously disapproval and disgust could be kind of similar. So we see that being returned as multiple emotions and this is the Spanish language translation. We see this as a preview across some of our data rows. And if we feel confident about this, we can go ahead and hit submit and this will trigger the job on the entire data set. I've already gone ahead and done that for the sake of time. And so we can see over here the result of running the inference job. We see that, you know, this is the model run. These are a few of the predictions. And we can see over here what GPT returned with those predictions. Once we have all of this set up, the next sort of logical workflow is to send all of these pre-labels to a labeling project for the reviewing team or the labeling team to go ahead and be able to iterate on. So as an example, we can you know, select some of these records. We can send this over to a labeling project and say, let's make this in the review task and let's include the model predictions and include the annotations and select our project. And we have our priority there. And like I said, because we had already ingested this with annotations, we are seeing this option here. Um, we can override this with the new predictions that we've created and hit submit. And if we navigate over to the progress, we can see once that's ready and once it's ready, we can navigate to our project, our data rows. And we see over here, these are the three records we just selected to uh, be reviewed. And if we go ahead and hit start reviewing, you can see this was created 25 seconds ago. We have two tabs open. So let's go ahead and close one of the tabs. And Notice now that we have pre-populated these values with labels, the same labels that GPT had come up with. And so this, what we've seen, uh, leads to a dramatic reduction in, in terms of labeling time, because now the labeling process has become a review task. A reviewer just comes in and uh, goes through and validates or invalidates the labels that GPT has come up with. So they can go through this, they can make edits if they feel like they want to change something over here. Um, and hit save, or if they want to raise an issue, they can go ahead and raise an issue and say that this needs to be reworked, create that issue. And once they're gone and finished, you know, going through the review process, they can either approve or reject the label. And they keep doing this for all the different uh, labeling tasks. Previously, we had seen how to leverage a foundation model like GPT-4 
to help with pre-labeling our data. That is one flavor of model-assisted labeling within Labelbox. We can also achieve model-assisted labeling, or MAL, by using the Python SDK. So if we navigate over to our guides, we can see that the appropriate one for text data, if we open that Colab notebook up, it will take us to different ways in which we can use the annotation. So as an example, if we wanted to identify a named entity within our text document or text-based asset, we simply need to specify the start and ending location of that entity. In our case, we want to look at the emotion classification value. And so the idea here is that however you come up with your prediction or your annotation that you want to send to Labelbox, so long as it meets this specific format, either of these formats, either as a Python annotation or as an NDJSON annotation, that's how we can achieve mall assisted labeling. And so in our case, we had set up our ontology to incorporate and attach the emotion value that we see over here to this feature name, the emotion underscore single feature name. And this was in our data ingestion script. We saw that over here where we had specified the emotion single to be the name of the feature. So once we specify that feature name and that feature value, it's really as simple as just if we wanted to test this on one example, we can navigate to the UI. And so this is an example that we want to test on. We'll copy this uh, ID value that we see over here. We'll paste that over here and we can paste that over here and here as well. Um, once again, either using Python annotation or NDJSON annotation, and this is the text asset we want to test on. Once we've teed all those up, the final step is to simply run this small assisted labeling uh, import job, and this will actually go ahead and attach that value uh, to what we see in the UI. So the end result of this is if we navigate to the editor and we can go to the review workflow, hit start reviewing, and we see this value is pre-populated with approval because we had said that in our uh, in our model assisted labeling value right here. So that really wraps up the second way to uh, bring in your labels. And like I said, the, the meat of it is just making sure that it follows either of these two formats. Thank you. The final step in our product overview is label box model. In terms of where we are in our journey is we've curated our data in Labelbox Catalog, we've labeled our data in Labelbox Annotate, and we've taken all of that labeled data and let's say we've trained a model. How can we bring that model's predictions back into Labelbox in order to measure the model performance and label prediction quality and use active learning to figure out where the model is weak and make it stronger and more accurate. So first things first, in order for us to calculate all of the important evaluation metrics from precision, recall, false positives, false negatives, and use this empirical knowledge to help guide us in making the model more accurate, we need two things. We need the ground truth and we need the predictions. So let's start with the ground truth we're going to click on creating a new model experiment. And we can name that experiment as we feel appropriate, hit next. And we wanna connect this to our ontology, which in this case is the emotions ontology. And we want to choose our project. And when we hit this create model with the number of data rows, this is going to trigger a job that will load in all of the labeled data into this model experiment. While we're adding ground truth to our model experiment, let's now see how to upload our predictions to the model experiment. The way we're going to upload predictions is if we go to the upload predictions to a model run documentation, we'll click on the import text predictions notebook. And notice over here, this is very similar to the model assisted labeling format we saw earlier, where we essentially need to construct our predictions in the following formats, either as an NDJSON or as a Python annotation. 
And so we're going to be working towards this goal for coming up with all of our predictions in this format. So if we recall earlier, we had seen how to use GPT-4 in Foundry as our labeling copilot to generate pre-labels as one version or flavor of model assisted labeling. But because we already had ground truth labels provided from the hugging face dataset, we didn't really need to do anything with those GPT pre-labels or send those model assisted GPT pre-labels to a labeling team for them to edit or modify. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to pretend like that off the shelf GPT-4 model we previously used is like our production model that we've trained. And we're going to showcase how the label box model capabilities work using that GPT-4 model and its predictions. And so if we navigate over to the GPT-4 card, so if you go to model and click on GPT-4, we can see that these are different model runs and we'll click on the model run corresponding to the one that we had done. And if we click into one of these, we can see the emotion value that was predicted by GPT-4. So these are the predictions that we want to bring in to our mall experiment. And the idea is that if we had a custom model, whether that's a Qualtrics specific model or any other model that we wanted to use, then the workflow here would be exactly the same. Instead of navigating to the GPT-4 option over here, we would be seeing a Qualtrics model and we could click on that model card and we'd be able to see the runs associated with that customer specific model. So going back to the GPT-4 one, we need to get the model ID, which can be found over here as the model ID. And we need to copy the model run ID as well. So we need to copy both this value and this value. And once we copy those values, we'll paste them over here in their respective sections, the source model ID and the source model run ID. We also need the project ID, which we had set up earlier. If we navigate to our uh, Emotions for Demo project, we see that over here. So let's now, once we have all those three uh, values, the next step is to export the GPT-4 predictions, which is what's being done over here. And once we export those predictions, we can see what that looks like. So these are as an example of a row data, as well as the value that GPT-4 predicted as the emotion. And we have that for all of our data. Once we have that export JSON, we're going to construct the prediction list. And this is similar to, like we had seen earlier, the list format in this, um, in this annotation scheme. So we're going through, we're going through the export JSON and we're parsing out the value for the emotion and we're constructing it as a Python annotation. So this classification annotation that we see over here. And once we go through and do that for all of our predictions, we can see what the, uh, an example prediction looks like. We can see the emotion name over here. And then the penultimate step is to get the model experiment ID. So this can be found by clicking into our motion experiment. This is our model experiment ID. So we copy this value and we paste it over here. And the model run is going to be based on the one we create from the UI. So let's create new model run. We'll name this as GPT-4 model and hit create model run. And we can now copy this model run ID and paste it over here. So now we've set everything up and all we need to do is click on this cell and this will go ahead and upload all of the predictions from GPT-4 into this model run. Now that we have our predictions and ground truth annotations, all loaded up in our model experiment, we can see what the evaluation metrics look like. If we click on the metrics view, we are taken to 
a page where we can see the different classification metrics, as well as our confusion matrix, where the ground truth's on the y-axis and the predictions along the x-axis, the true positives are all on the on diagonal and everything on the off diagonal are incorrect predictions. If we scroll down, we can also see different charts for precision and recall by confidence threshold, distribution by classes and by values, and other such important KPIs. If we navigate back to the confusion matrix, what's really helpful from here is that we can visually see where are the model deficiencies or weakness. So up here, for example, we're seeing 508 instances where the ground truth is labeled as admiration, but GPT-4 predicted it as approval. And can make sense here because those two emotion categories are fairly similar. If we also notice down here, there's 247 occurrences where joy and amusement are mispredicted and miscategorized. Once again, fairly similar between those two emotion categories. And over here, there's a pretty large area where 1,012 text-based assets are incorrectly predicted as amusement from neutral. So if we click into here, there's two sorts of scenarios here. There's the scenario where there's an issue with your ground truth or the annotations themselves, or it could be an issue with the predictions. And so if there's an issue with the predictions, then that's a good situation for let's say finding all such similar records in our large data set. So what we're saying here is that what are all the unannotated records that are similar to the ones that we've chosen and the ones where we've identified the model is incorrectly predicting. And the logic here is that because they're similar and lie in the same embedding space, then very likely these data rows are going to be incorrectly predicted as well. And so what we can do is we can obviously toggle the confidence here as we feel appropriate. In this case, let's say we just want to stick with the default. We see you know, 58,000 data rows narrowed down to 290. These are all unannotated and we want to prioritize these for our model. So we can click on this, send this to a labeling project, say there's a high priority for them and move it to the initial labeling task. And now the labelers will address these text-based assets first because they tend to be a predominant theme where the model is currently not doing as great of a job. So that's one such capability. We can also, if we go back to our model experiment page, there's a situation where maybe your ground truth annotation itself is incorrect. And in that case, what we can do is we can select our records. We can say view and catalog. And now from here, I can select these and say, how about I add the classification and say that I know that there's a wrong in my ground truth. So what I'll do is I'll say that this should, instead of neutral, which it, it is currently, I'll make this as amusement because that's the correct ground truth. So there's different ways in which we can play around and make our model better. As we see over here, we can choose to bulk classify. If we feel confident that the ground truth is incorrect, we can send that to the appropriate step or we can uh, choose to send our unlabeled data rows to a labeling project and set a very high priority in order for the labelers to address those. Now that we've seen how to construct a model experiment and how that model experiment contains a model run, let's see how we can add another model run to compare two different model runs. So in this situation, I've gone ahead and added Gemini V0. The way I did that was by creating new model run and naming that new model run as Gemini V0 and then hitting create model. Now, once I did that, I ran the same script as we had done for GPT. Instead, I used the Gemini model and uploaded the predictions from that. And when I did that, I'm now able to see that GPT-4 did somewhat better than Gemini. And I'm able to see empirically the confusion matrices for the two 
different models as well as the different charts. Now, the idea here is that we're comparing GPT-4 and Gemini, but these experiments can be however way you want to design them. So maybe you want to compare multiple versions of GPT-4 where you've changed some hyperparameters like the temperature or you fine tuned the GPT-4 model and you want to compare different versions of it. That's how you can construct this comparison. Maybe you want to compare multiple versions of Gemini or compare models apart from GPT and Gemini, or maybe you just want to compare different versions of your own customer specific model. This is how we can make that comparison.